This is Ben Woodford here at Modern Education Radio Hour in 90.1 KZSU Stanford. This is a show where we dig into everything from current research trends to far out ideas concerning any topic even remotely related to education. I'm Ben Woodford, your host here in the studio. I'll be with you every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. for your commute. Here at Modern Education, we bring cutting-edge ideas, philosophical discussions, insights from experts, and just about everything else you want to know. The goal is to help listeners interact with and understand learning in all its forms. If you have questions or suggestions for the show, you can tweet at BenWoodford1 on Twitter. I'll do my best to include your ideas in future shows. If you're a teacher, parent, student, or anyone interested in our collective future, I hope you'll tune in each week as we examine new ideas and interview guests from a variety of backgrounds. Back in the studio with Modern Education, I'm your host, Ben Woodford. In education news this week, a recent study showed that investing in early childhood interventions for low-income children more than pays for itself. Researchers followed a group of almost 1,000 children since 1980. Then they looked at the group's contributions to society measured by multiple factors. The lead author, Arthur Reynolds, was quoted saying, We need to think about early childhood as school reform. We need a concerted effort across school districts, mayors, principals, and community activists to think about how we can align the services we provide. Reynolds' team from the Institute of Child Development at the University of Minnesota completed a related study that showed the financial return was almost $11 for every dollar spent on effective intervention for children. These and other related findings, there's a whole body of evidence starting to build around this, shows that investing in young people is not only a good idea, but it makes solid economic sense. Now, my question for the audience, why isn't America making investments in early childhood intervention when we know it pays back a thousand percent, which is better than any investment I've ever heard of anywhere? Now, if you have any thoughts about this, you can tweet at Ben Woodford one and let me know your thoughts on it. You can always look me up on social media as well. I would love to hear your thoughts and get a little input as far as why you think America is not making these important investments. Now, in the studio, I have a guest, Kiana Job. She is... Uh, amazing high school teacher. She holds a BA in mathematics from Sonoma State University with a concentration in secondary teaching. She has a single subject teaching credential earned from Cal State Monterey Bay in mathematics. She loves spending time with her two dogs and her significant other, Ryan. Kiana also enjoys traveling, good food, and dancing. Now, uh, I'm going to bring her on the mic here and say hello. Kiana, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Ben. It's great to be here. All right. I'm very excited to have you here. And I wanted to start just talking about how you started. How did you decide or what made you want to start studying math first? The math question. You know, I get that one a lot because not a lot of people like math. And it's going to sound a little crazy, but I actually started out in college my freshman year as a liberal arts major. I always knew I wanted to be a teacher, always like helping, mentoring, just saw myself as a teacher kind of my whole life. I went in thinking I was going to teach elementary school. And I was reading, writing, doing all the liberal arts And it just was kind of boring. I know that sounds terrible, but I missed the logic. Mm -hmm. I missed the challenge. I missed when your brain hurts because you do math and you get it right and it hurts, but it's so good. And and I missed that. So I went into math Mm -hmm. and it was hard. It was challenging. And people kept saying, why? Why are you doing math? And it, it feels good. It's a challenge. I like it. And they said, oh, no, you're, you're a girl. Nah, no, math, that wouldn't be right for you. You should go back to elementary school teaching. And I, I, I'd really like to prove you wrong. Yeah. And that's kind of where it, where it came from. I like the challenge. I like proving people wrong. Uh, so that's, that's how it happened. Yeah. So it sounds like you had a challenge put before you. And you rose up to that yes. challenge and it took you in a whole different direction than what you thought. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Kind of out of left field, but it happened. Yeah. yeah. Do you think girls get a lot of this sort of uh, stereotyping about their abilities in math and science? We do, unfortunately. And I was studying math and people were like, oh, well, you're going to make a great teacher. Um, well, I don't have to teach, you know, but they always would see me in a teaching role, uh, even, you know, as a math major. So... 
it was unfortunate, even as a math student, I still had to be a teacher because I was a girl. Wow. Yeah. 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 And yeah, it's, it's so unfair and so many girls have to face that. And it is. Women are amazing at math. I've Thank you. worked with many that I've been like, man, I wish I was that smart. Thank so. you. Yeah, they were great. Yeah, sorry, but yes. Nope. You need to apologize for that. It came and out a little vain. Modern, modern education is all about promoting women in math and science awesome. and awesome. arts too. You know? Yes, it's easy. absolutely. I'm, I'm, I, I call myself a math person, although I hate that term. Right. Because I actually love math. Maybe mathematician is a better term. I think so, yeah. But... I think anyone can be great at math, and the real point is, do we want to be? Absolutely. And you wanted to be, yes. and you are, and yes. you continue to be great. <laughs> Thank That's you. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing sure, that story. Sure. Now, what about becoming a teacher? You mentioned that you know you always kind of thought you wanted to be a teacher. You had maybe felt the calling, or maybe even you had to teach all through school, teach people how to respect you and your field, teach people lots of stuff. But where do you think that comes from? Why teaching? Why teaching? Um, my whole life, I just like helping people. And for me, it comes out of a helping heart and caring for people and seeing them in need, knowing you can, you can help them get somewhere. You can help them learn something. And I've always just known that my, my heart wants to help people and teaching seemed like a really easy way to do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And do you feel like you are doing that? I do. Yeah. I feel I feel very fulfilled. I do. Yeah. 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 What's the most fulfilling part, or is there a story that really hits home how this job is fulfilling for you? You know, I have almost two hundred students, <laughs> and I have relationships with all of them. I would, I would like to, to believe. I know some students would not like to, to think that, but I think I have relationships with all of them and each one of our relationships is a success story to me and I care about them. Um, so a story in particular, not so much, but being able to have relationships with each one of them is, is really what makes me happy and that's what I enjoy most. Yeah. 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 And there's not very many jobs where you can say that you have personally had an in depth, caring relationship with 200 young people. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Is it ever hard to let them go? Oh, at the end of my the school goodness. Year? Oh, my goodness. When I would graduate? say, you know, people always talk about what's so hard about teaching and, you know, grading's hard, but it's, it's most hard when you are so involved in their lives and you care about them. For almost a year, I have some of them for two years, three years, and then all of a sudden, they're just gone. <laughs> and you, you don't get to see them again. You don't know if you made an impact on them. You don't know what they're up to. You don't know if they're okay. You don't know if they followed their dreams. It's, it's sad. <laughs> it does yeah. make me sad that I don't, I don't know where they are and how they're doing after I see them every day for hours, for years. Yeah. And then they're gone. Yeah. 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 That is so difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I always thought that was maybe one of the hardest parts about teaching is never knowing what the work you're doing, how it will play out in their lives. You know, we right. want to think that we're doing our best and we always want to be there for our students, but we don't ever really know. And it's very hard to tell. Yes. I remember, yes. I remember in my teacher training, there was a, a teacher came in and talked to us about a student who came back 10 years later or 15 years later mm -hmm. and wanted to tell the teacher what a wonderful person they were and how much they had an effect on their lives. And the teacher told us, he said, you know, I barely remembered the kid. It'd been so long. And I remember what I did remember is he didn't even like my class. It didn't even <laughs> seem like he wanted yeah. to be there. Yeah. And so it's like, you never know. Right. You never know right. how you're getting through to them. And it's really hard to ever know. You may have a student that comes back once and tells you. But, right. But mm -hmm. there may be hundreds out there that think yeah. of you. And, yeah. Yeah. And fondly it's going on the thousands now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. How long have you been teaching? Uh, this is my fifth year. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And what, do, what would you say? Okay, we talked a little bit maybe about the hardest part of teaching, okay. right? What's okay. What's the best part? 
Uh, I would say being at school every day. I know this sounds weird, but I kind of feel like a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't you sound know? weird at all to teachers. I, I see these 200 faces every day, and then I come into class, and it's, good morning, Miss Jobo, hi. And it's like, oh, oh, it gives you a little pep in your step, you know? Yeah. It's really early in the morning, and I didn't you know, want to wake up, and I didn't want to come to work, but you know, seeing your smiling face, and there's 40 of you just staring at me so excited, <laughs> it's, it's really... Wonderful. There's, so, I just love them so much. <laughs> having yeah. them, having them, and their their cute little faces, having all those relationships. That's that's the best part. Yeah. Is yeah. it ever hard to get up in the morning and make it to another? Oh day of my school? goodness gracious! Why does it start so early? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get you out of bed in the morning when when you know you've had a, a tough day. Or I I think about those individual students. Mm-hmm. And I think about the relationships I have with them. And I, I mean, as a teacher, having a sub is quite a hassle. So yeah. <laughs> I don't want to have a sub. So I, I need to get there and I need to teach them what I want to teach them. And I need to see them and make sure they're okay and um, build that relationship, those relationships. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a lot of ownership there, right? You feel responsible. I do. I really yeah. do. Yeah. Is, does your paycheck the thing that makes you feel responsible? Uh, not really. No. no. What is it? What no. do you think it is? Um, what makes me responsible for them? This feeling of ownership. Where do you think that comes from? I feel like I'm their, their caretakers and I, I own whether or not they learn. Mm. And that's, that's a big responsibility. It is. Because if I don't teach them well, then they're not going to learn this. And that's, that's the ownership. And right. I, I see them learn every day. And so I know I'm, I'm able to do it and effective and I do have the ability. Yeah. So I, I know it's possible and I, and I, I own that. Yeah. 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 So you're just saying, it sounds like mm-hmm. you have a physical and a real feeling that you own this job and it has nothing to do with standardized tests or how much they pay you? I sp- I suppose not. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so it's like yeah. the government is doing all this work to try to measure whether yeah. you're doing a good job, and yet you put the pressure on yourself to take ownership over your responsibilities. I, I guess you're right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's Never the, thought of it that way. Yeah. 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 It seems profound to me that there isn't, it isn't these outside measures and pressures that make you take ownership, but instead it's yeah. your own personal intrinsic care for what you're doing and why you're here. Yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's such an important thing for us to remember as parents and, and principals and community members is that yeah. teachers aren't doing this because the standardized tests make them feel good. No. Or because the, the metrics the government puts out really validate their work, right? Right. You're doing right. it for your own intrinsic motivation because yes. you care about the people you're working with. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. You ever felt like that about other things in your life? Uh, that I own it. Yeah. Um, that's an excellent question. I wasn't expecting that one. Um, yeah, I mean, who I am, I have to own every day. Yeah. Inside, outside the classroom, regardless of my career, I, I own who I am. And it's taken me a long time to get there as a person. And my family... I have to I have to own my family and my friends and our relationships. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Right. It's almost like all the important things in our lives we don't need to be told to take care of them. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. That's that's what it is. What's what's in my heart and what's close to me, I guess. I would I would own all that. Right. Yeah. 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 It sounds like a, a great plan for how we can make learning relevant to people, give them things they care about. Yes. And then trust them to take ownership over it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent plan. <laughs> how do we do that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was hoping you would know. So we could be, you know, it's done, case closed, no more modern education because we have the answer, but that's okay. Yeah. It's not such a simple problem. Not, not so easy. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> now, 
I wanted to ask you about, just say I just handed you a magic wand. I'm, I, in, for those of you on the airwaves, I'm handing her an invisible magic wand. What would be the one or two or the primary pr- objectives of what you would change if you could just wave your wand and make school a little bit different or change just a couple aspects? School itself? Sure. Your classrooms, student dispositions, any way you want to take this. What would you change if you had the ability to change something about the way schools run? I would have to say, one, can it be multiple things? I can oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> there's, there's so many. Yeah. Um, I hate the hoops I have to jump through. The, can you, you expand on that a little? The meetings. Uh-huh. I have so many meetings. I have so many things I have to do every day that get in, get in the way. They get in the way of what I teach the kids and how I care for them. And there's so many things that I have to do for that, that it impedes my ability to teach my students. Yeah. And it's a lot of different things. It's not just meetings, it's standardized testing. It's the things that they tell us to do in the meetings, what we have to do in our classrooms. It's the people coming in in the middle of class telling me, oh, this needs to happen. It's all the things that that aren't teaching itself Hmm. that get in the way. Yeah. Of me just teaching my kids. Um, that's that's so frustrating. <laughs> yeah. There's only maybe periods in my classroom, maybe of 10 minutes at a time where I'm able to be real with them um, and, and teach them because there's so much other stuff I have to do. Go take attendance, answer emails, put in grades, yeah. all that stuff. Maybe yeah. if someone else could do it for me, <laughs> maybe that would be an easy fix. Um, but I feel like I do two people's jobs. Yeah. You know, I do all this annoying stuff, all these hoops, and then right. I also have to be this really awesome educator that cares for the kids and designs all these awesome lessons. Right. But then, oh, don't forget to take attendance. <laughs> <laughs> so if I was to sort of paraphrase what you were just saying, mm-hmm. would it be fair to say that if you had some support staff that were doing some of the more clerical type things yes. for you, that would really make your job easier? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, that doesn't seem like it would be that hard, right? What if each each wing of the school had one secretary that would come by and run roll real quick and these run are a things my errands? dreams are made of, Ben. <laughs> Keep talking. Oh, these are these are these are simple, right? We just yes. need somebody listening that'll yes. do something about it. Yes, that would be amazing. Yeah, that okay, would really so, help me out. So let's focusing on teaching would be great. Getting rid of a lot of the sort of baggage that comes along with it. Do you feel like you're trusted as a professional to follow through on these things? I do feel trusted, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I've, Can you give an example of how that plays out? Maybe my boss, my department chair. Mm-hmm. She doesn't say, oh, how, how's it going? She just knows that I'm able to do it. Right. Principals, they just, they just know. Yeah. I, I don't know how they know, <laughs> but they, they trust me. Right. And I've never been um, tested like that. Yeah. And so I, I feel confident in what I do and I feel, I feel trusted because yeah. I've never, never been tested. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it does, yeah. <laughs> and, and you're lucky. I don't think all teachers have had that same experience. I think some Maybe. teachers get micromanaged quite yeah. a bit and yeah. don't have that sort of professional level of, or that professionalism True. that should go with the job. I mean, you right. work hard to get where you're at. Absolutely, right? yes. That's, we have a song later that I'm going to play that talks all about <laughs> the credentialing program. It's pretty funny. But <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, me too, actually. Yeah. yeah. So that sounds like a really big piece than having that professionalism it, and and taking some of the pieces off your plate that are not serving yes. your, you know, mm-hmm. what if you had a, a curriculum department developing different lesson ideas for you? That would and, be awesome. Yeah. yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah. It would be, yeah. right? Yes. It doesn't seem like it'd be that hard to do. I don't know why we don't have that stuff, but. Maybe money, funding. Yeah. Got to pay someone to do that. Right. Where, right. where I could do it and just run around like a crazy person. <laughs> you know? Well, you make it look easy. So <laughs> that's a good start. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Any other magic wands you would wave at or any other things you'd wave your wand at? Um, I would say one maybe comes from a different direction from the community. Okay. Um, I'll tell you maybe a little story. Please, yeah. 
say I'm at a barbecue with friends and you're hanging out, eating your hamburgers, hot dogs, you make casual conversation. So it always comes up, so what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a teacher. And they say, well, what, what grade? And I tell them, oh, high school, high school math, they teach statistics. And do you know what the number one response is to that? I probably do, but I want to hear you say it. <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> Are you crazy? And I mean, to a certain degree, I guess I am, but I think it's crazy on a different level. Mm -hmm. They think I'm crazy because I'm dealing with teenagers. Right. And it's really unfortunate that it's the teenager piece that makes me crazy. It's not the math. It's not the teaching. Mm -hmm. It's, well, aren't they annoying? They're punks. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not. They're such wonderful people. Right. They're wonderful human beings. I would like to change their image and how mm. people think of them. They have so much to give the world and they're not jaded by anything that's happened to them and they're so excited to live their lives and I believe in them. Yeah. And yeah. the community, these people at the barbecues or anyone, they just they don't believe in the teenagers. Right. They're our future. They are. We need to believe in our future. Oh, I am so happy to hear that from someone else that believes it as well. That's so awesome. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So what do you think that does, this perception of teenagers being ineffective? Or how do you think that affects us as a society or you and your job? Well, my teenagers are always a little standoffish with me. When they first come into my class, it's the beginning of the year, they, they don't want to trust me because they don't know that I care and they don't, they think I'm just going to say, oh, you little punks, you're so annoying. I'm always mad at you, you know? Because they've had that before. Yes, and they get that even from other teachers, from other people in their lives. Um, and it really isn't good for them. It isn't good for those, their self-esteem, and um, it hurts me a little bit. Yeah. It does. Um, yeah. I don't know, you know, <laughs> what else I can do about that. Um, but... The community needs to step in a little bit, I think. Yeah. 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 Believe I mean, in them a little bit. Young people have such a hard time as it is. We, yes. we all remember what it's yes. like being a teenager. That's tough. It's rough. Even when it's you're an so accomplished rough. and yes. hardworking teenager. Most definitely. You still have a lot to deal with yes. there. And having that belief and that faith in you put by the adults in your life, that's right. got to go a long way to yes. alleviate that. Yes, totally. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. I would love to see that as well. I wish I actually had a magic wand for you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Now, is there anything else, uh, just before we get off this topic, anything else that you would love to see changed if you had the ability? Uh, more money. I'd like to get paid more. Huh. <laughs> A little more recognition, not just, hey, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you're, you're doing something for our future. You're taking care of our kids. Thank you. Here's a little bit more money, a little bit more time. Right. That would be great. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of my 10th graders when I, was, when I was in high school teaching, he came yeah. to me one day and he said, Mr. Woodford, why is it we celebrate lawyers and doctors when none of them would be there without teachers? Wow. Right? A 10th grader. Yeah. That's tenth, impressive. 10th grader <laughs> laid out to me better than most adults what's wrong with our society. Mm. And That's profound. Isn't it? Yes. Isn't it? And, you know, we. It, this seems especially salient right now with all the stuff going on with the, the survivors from the recent shootings and yeah. how the teenagers are really stepping up and yes. and trying to take action. And I've been so just appalled at people online making fun of these kids. Yeah. And, and it's like these kids are taking the reins in ways that a lot of us adults are not and never Absolutely. Have. Yeah. We're too afraid to. Right. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I mean, I wish I was doing the work with them. And, yeah. You know, maybe yes. in a way we all are doing a little right. bit, those of us that care. Yeah. Or, you know, that deliberately try. But at the same time, it's like when kids can do stuff like this, why aren't we giving them, you know, money and support and yes. encouragement? Respect. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I mean, your students, my students, these students that we're, we're referring to, and they do amazing things. They have these really deep, intuitive understandings of the world. They do. And we discount them. Yes. We push them to the side and say, you're not grown up yet. Wait right. till you're an adult. Then right. you'll know. Right. Right. 
you're not jaded yet, so. <laughs> right, right. You haven't yeah. quit, so we're not right. going to encourage you till right. you quit. <laughs> right, absolutely. Yeah. Strange. Yeah. Very strange. Wow. Well, you know, I think these are some great, great things that are so easy and seem so obvious when you say them, and yet we're not seeing them in our administration and the government in the, yeah. the supports that we really need as mm -hmm. teachers and educators and parents and students. We all need these things. And if you can lay them out here, it really seems like a strange mystery to me why the powers that be don't come to the same conclusions yeah. and see how simple, like how hard would it be to get two extra administrative staff to be able to make your life easier and streamline right. your work every day? It wouldn't be that hard. No. And the cost versus the benefit, I think, would be huge. Right. The right. benefit to students, the benefit to long-term outcomes, the benefit for you. Yes. You might yeah. even not feel so bad about make, not making enough money to right. you know, buy a house right. or whatever <laughs> if you at least had the, the peace of mind to know that you were well taken care of and respected right. and supported. Yes, most definitely. Yeah. 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 Now, I know you're an AP teacher. Yes. Yeah. What does that mean? To, be, to tack AP onto a class, what does that mean to you? Well, it means it's a college level course in high school. So we learn a lot more and we go a lot deeper. It's a lot more difficult. And then at the, the end of the year in May, they have to take this big old AP test. And if you pass it, you get those college credits. Okay, so that's the, the nuts and bolts yeah. of what AP mm -hmm. means officially, right? Right. So what does it mean to you as a teacher? Do you have non-AP classes? Or they I all? do. Okay, mm -hmm. so what's the difference to you? How do you, do you approach that different, different from a different standpoint? Or I kind of have to. Okay, yeah. tell me about that. The AP courses are really, really rigorous, and we really have to push them. Okay. Getting through 12 chapters, finishing chapter 12 next week, it's it's a lot. And in my non-AP courses, uh, we don't learn quite as much and we don't go as deep hmm. and it's not as difficult. So I, I kind of wish we could have a mix of both because my non-AP courses, I don't know if we learn enough, <laughs> what, I would, what I would like to get them to learn, uh, but we do a lot more activities and we do a lot more, um, make them do a lot more silly things that are real life um, type of activities and have them um, do some, some silly stuff in class that involves partner work and group work and running around the school and doing things at home, making posters. And we just don't have time for that in AP. Oh man. Yeah. Those sound like really great learning opportunities. They are, though. and the kids love them, and it's fun. And then, you know, my my next my next period will come in, and their AP in the period before them wasn't. And they're like, oh, well, what's all this candy laying around, and <laughs> what are all these papers up on the walls? And I'm sorry, guys, we we got too much to learn. Wow. Yeah, I gotta shove it down your guys' throat almost. You know, it's it's a lot that yeah. we do to these AP kids. It's a lot of learning, a lot. Yeah, more yeah. stress too. I'm more stressed just teaching. I yeah. have to get these lessons done. Right. Yeah. Do you feel like that takes away from your, your professionalism when you have this very prescribed set of things you have to get done to say you did the AP credit? Yeah, yeah. I would say it also makes me a little less personable. Because, mm -hmm. okay, we don't have time to talk about that, guys. <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell you this cool story. You know, we, we got to learn this. We right. got to do another worksheet. <laughs> oh my gosh. And my other classes, you know, sometimes we'll just pause for 20 minutes and, okay, guys, you want to hear a story? <laughs> right, right. And I'll give them a story about my life and we'll talk about some interesting stuff that may or may not have that much to do with stats. Uh, but in AP, we don't, we don't have time for that. Right. So I can't have those really awesome learning experiences uh, from my own life that I might want to teach them. Yeah. Those are some of the best times, yes, aren't they? Yes, they really are. You they know, really are. It gives us a chance to really communicate with our students as a person yes. who they can relate to. And yes, and I, they love it. Yeah. And it's so <laughs> important, too, because if, right. we, if we don't respect the person and understand the person we're learning from, we really don't buy into learning the same way. I totally agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Learn that. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so yeah. I wanted to, to shift gears a little bit and talk about grading. So okay. 
Yeah. So first, I just wanted to ask, you know, do you have like a, a philosophy of gr how you approach grading or is that laid out by your school or what does grading look like as far as just the day to day? Day to day. Um, well, I would say at the start of my teaching career, I used to think it was something different and I used to what, feel what? like I had a lot more control. Mm hmm over the grades and it was this very set in stone thing. You have a B and you're getting a B and you earned a B and mm -hmm. this is a B. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but now I, you know, we, all of the teachers in the same cohort, so everyone who teaches math one, we all have the same grading system. So quizzes are worth this percent, tests are worth this percent, assignments this percent, et cetera. So that's sort of standard across all of our cohorts. Um, so that's that's a standardized thing, and our grade books look pretty similar mm -hmm. that we enter in. And so I have grades throughout the semester, their quizzes, their packets, their homework, whatever. And then at the end of the semester, I submit grades. If they have a B, B comes up on the screen, but I'm able to give them any grade. Hmm. And what does that mean for you? That kind of blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as a student, I earned a B. I got a B. I'm getting a B on my report card. Right. But that teacher has complete control. She can give you an F. She can give you A+. Plus. Yeah. It's, it, it still kind of blows my mind. Right. right. Yeah. So a grading, my perception of grading has definitely changed as a teacher. Right. That I have so much more control than I ever imagined. Right. Yeah, we always think of grades as this sort of external thing. Right. And maybe standardized tests are that way. Because right. we don't have any say in who designs the tests and what that means. But as a day to day, you know, grades are being done by a human for other humans, which means there's always yes. room to right. to work that system exactly. or to exactly to understand the context of where that grade is at in someone's life. Right. Now, we talked before about um, a situation that came up with grading. And I was sure. wondering if you could just sort of recount this this situation with the student who grades did not apply sure uh so this is this is a big story <laughs> um this was my first year teaching so i was under the impression that grades are very serious mm -hmm. this is the grade you're getting and i had this one student who pretty much never came to class she was a nice girl, very nice girl, but she just really wasn't there. When she was there, she would say she was gonna give me some work, but it just never really happened. I think the last week of school, she didn't even show up, mm -hmm. didn't take a final. So she had an F the whole semester, and so I had to fail her. So I go down to the counselors on senior F day, and I turn in all my lists, my list with all of my seniors who have an F. And so we're going through the seniors, and they say, oh, so-and-so. You're giving her an F? I say, well, yeah, she didn't show up. You know, I t didn't feel like I needed to explain myself, but I felt like the way they were looking at me had to. They said, oh, well, she's not going to graduate mm -hmm. because you're giving her this F. And I, well, I'm sorry that it is what it is. And this is what she learned. So I'm, I'm giving her an F. So I said, okay, all right. And then that was that. So I walked out of my classroom. This was maybe a week before graduation. Uh, then come graduation, I'm at graduation and guess who's on the stage graduating with her class? Wow. It's that student. Did you change the grade? I did not change the grade. Huh, so what, what do you, if you had to just take a wild guess, what do you think happened? I think someone changed her grade wow. because they wanted her to pass and they yeah. wanted her to graduate. And it didn't matter what grade I gave her. And do, do you have a sense of her economic, socioeconomic status and race background? She's, she's, yeah, she's white and she's well known in the community and her family is well known and she's a nice girl and well known in the community, that family. Yeah. yeah, so it seems like, and we don't know for sure, but it does seem like maybe her her privilege in yes. the community and her status was able yes. to get her past and maybe keep doors open for college and other things like that that would have been closed right. if she failed out of high school. Right. Now, I know the, the other part of this story yes. we were talking about 
mm-hmm. uh, another student who was in a similar situation. Correct. Can you, can you fill us in about yes, that? Yes. So that was my first year teaching. Um, and I was, you know, kind of, kind of new to the game. I didn't know what was going on. I was like, maybe, you know, they changed this girl's gray. I don't know what's going on. Maybe something came up. So she could actually graduate. Maybe it was a mistake somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wasn't too worried about it, but a couple years later, I had another student in a very similar situation, had a F the whole semester, didn't turn in her final project. So she was getting an F and I went down to the counselors, same thing on senior F day. Here's my list. Um, they didn't say anything for some reason. I, I don't know why. And then as I'm walking back up to my classroom, here's the student. She's with her brother and they're both crying. Mm-hmm. I just turned in my list. Yeah. Just turned in my list and they're crying and she has all of her makeup work right there. Here's my project. Here's this. Here's this. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to pass. I'm going to graduate now. I go, oh, 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 I wasn't expecting this. So I went back down to the counselor and I walked into the office um, and I said, oh, well, here's so-and-so. She has all of her stuff. Can we just change your grade now? No. They, they wouldn't let me. They wouldn't let her. They're there crying. Nope. Wow. So, and what, what do you think her um, socioeconomic status and race? Her family was from El Salvador uh-huh. and pretty, pretty low socioeconomic wow. status. Yeah. So uh, this, this story really touched me when we talked about yeah. it. And it's part of the reason why I was really hoping to get you in here because I think this is something that happens really often. Yes. And it's something that affects a lot of students and a lot of teachers. Right. And... and I'm hoping that by getting your story, this this mm-hmm. story out here, maybe it's not your story completely, but to be able to just demonstrate how much you as a teacher have the ability to really be that the mediator right. between what opportunity and privilege your students have and what opportunity and privilege they'll get later in life. Right. And it's such a a meaningful thing for us as teachers. I mean, I'm not in the classroom anymore, Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I remember it well thinking, man, some of these students, they just need a chance. They just need someone to believe in them. Right. They need, you know, a little bit of a push to get where they're going. And, you know, some students have all the money and tutors and support and everything they need and they do great. Other students work their butts off all on their own with no supports and Mm -hmm. do great. Yes. But I think this story is really special in that it shows how much that privilege can change the route of a person's life. Right. When they have someone in their corner, when they're, you know, respected and and thought of in the community as someone who's nice or capable. Yes. Will bend the rules, will make Mm -hmm. options for them. Yeah. And then a student who doesn't have that could just get left to the wayside and it's no fault of theirs. They didn't ask to be born with no privileges. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Powerful. It breaks my heart. Mine too. Yeah. Mine too. So... Does that has this affected you in any way as far as the way you think about the implications of your job? Absolutely. Can you- yeah, I always, like I said, I always thought grades were just grades, and this is what it was. And then I kind of learned that they're not. I can just come when I have to turn in my grades, and I can just change that grade. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're graduating. And so it's really made me think a lot more if I'm going to fail someone and they're not going to graduate. Right. It made me think a lot more yeah. about whether or not I'm going to do that. Right. And I do everything in my power now so that I don't have to turn in that list with the F on it and they won't graduate. Right. I make a big effort now. That doesn't happen. And I I've, haven't done it since those two. Right. Yeah. I haven't done it since then. Right. And that's, I, th- I hope every teacher that hears this for as long as it's out there for them to hear yeah. understands that it is their responsibility. Absolutely. And there, is yeah. not, there is not some eye in the sky watching their every move, regulating right. them to right. make sure it's fair because that's right. not fair. The way, right. the way if, if we treat every student the same, yes. it's not fair. Right. And we have the ability to change the course of the life of a young person. Right. And your story, I think, just illustrates that so well. And I am so happy that we we got the chance to share this with more than just me. Yes, me too. Now, 
Now, I wanted to ask just if you lived in a perfect world, Mm -hmm. what would you be doing for students as a teacher? If they had all the supports they needed and you knew they would have all the food that they needed and books and supplies and every student was coming with a support system, what would you be doing as their teacher? I think I could make individualized learning plans for each one because we're all different and we don't just need this set curriculum for each and every student. I think making a special learning plan for each one of them would be so amazing and that would make me so happy because some of them are so interested in some things and they should really dive deep into that and for them to really be interested in that and for me to supply them uh, with all the possible tools for each and every one of them, that would be awesome for me because yeah. then they would be interested and that's, that's the goal is that their heart's in it And they're learning about it because they care. Yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah, it would be tough. Oh, yeah. You have a lot of students. I would need a lot of support for that one. Right, right. (laughs) But if you could give me that support, that would be ideal. Yeah. That would be absolutely ideal. Yeah, Yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. It seems so simple yet again. Right. If we could... Yeah, that's like what we do in college. We say, well, you choose what you're interested in and you're going to study it. Right. <laughs> and then here's all the teachers to support you right. <laughs> and the classes. So if we could do that in high school, that would yeah. be awesome. Why do you think we don't? Because every kid has to get their, their standards in. <laughs> Reading, writing, math. It's <laughs> Right. We're back to those standards. Yeah. yeah it's, what, it's what we got to teach them. They right. have to know something when they graduate. Right, right. And uh, sadly, we think they need to all know the same exact things. Right, right. (laughs) Like they all learn it completely. Right, right. (laughs) (laughs) Same things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now I did a little bit of of digging on the internet. I know you live in the kind of Gilroy area. Yes. And the median house price in Gilroy is (laughs) $611,000. And it's appreciated 60% since the year 2000. Wow. I didn't know that. (laughs) Now... Do you own your house right now? Do you live in a house uh, that you own? I do not. Hmm. We rent. And are, is it because you can't afford a house or because you just don't want to? I can or? barely afford renting. Wow. <laughs> now, what would it mean to you to be able to afford to buy a house and travel and have that extra freedom outside of your work? I would be so happy. I feel like I would have a place in my community because right now I don't. I just kind of have to bounce around to whatever affordable place I can find to live. And I'm not even able to, to own my own house when all these other people are. And I'm caring for their kids, raising their kids, and I can't even live in the area. Wow. It hurts a it little must. bit. Yeah. yeah. It's like a knife in the back when you're, right. you're dedicating right. your life. Right. Yeah. What yeah. do you think... Why do you think that it's this way? Uh, Why don't we pay teachers enough? Because we're paying all of our money to something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Priorities, right? Priorities, yeah. Yeah. We, Mm -hmm. you know, I I bet most people, if you ask them what's the most important thing, they would say, the children, it's the children. Right, right. But we don't put our money where our mouth is. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this inflation, too. So mm-hmm. the, the house prices have gone up 60% since 2000 yeah. in, your, in your town. Has your pay gone up to, to meet that? Uh, a little. Okay. A little. It, it has gone up, yeah. Okay, I know you haven't yeah. been teaching since 2000, so it's not a right, exact right. metric here. But yeah. do you feel like, I mean, you, you can't afford to buy a house now. Do you right. think your, your pay is increasing at a rate that will match the, no. the rate of house inflation? <laughs> it, it has increased, but not enough. Yeah. Not enough. Definitely not that much. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In my mind, it should be criminal to ask teachers to work in an area that they can't afford to live. Right. And not give them raises that are commensurate with the amount of inflation yeah. going on for yeah. things like buying houses and buying groceries. Right. That's why you get a lot of miserable teachers. 
Right, <laughs> right. And uh, in a lot of ways that gives all of us a bad name because right. a teacher that's in the classroom because they have no other options or right. they don't love it anymore, but they're still there yes. holding on. Right. It, it is, these are the teachers that snap at the students and make the students untrusting yes. when they come to your class exactly. for the first time. Right. You're absolutely right. And yeah, it's just such a, just such a hard thing. And it breaks my heart to be even having, yeah, that we need to have I this know. conversation. I know. Because you should have that professional respect and you should have the pay that goes along with that. Yes. I mean, what if all the doctors got together and said, we're going to make a fund for teachers that because sounds we, great. <laughs> we wouldn't have made it without them. And all the right. lawyers too, they all started a right. pool and started chipping yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't, I'm not sure that the government's ever going to do it. I know. That's where it needs to come from. Right. Yeah. Right. But maybe, who knows, maybe people will surprise us someday. Uh, I sure hope so. (laughs) I've got hope. (laughs) I'm holding out. You deserve it. (laughs) Yes. You really do. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Now, uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit, but I was poking around online and just reading about what people think about teachers. And a lot of people say it's a, it's a rosy job that has good ba- benefits and good hours and, you know, you get summers off and it sounds like such a great thing. Yeah. What is it like for you? Like hourly commitment as far as grading and waking up in the morning and even yeah. summers. Like what is what are you putting into your classroom outside of the actual classroom? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, for me, I would I would describe myself as dedicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is definitely not all teachers, but I put my whole heart into it every day. All my periods, all the time. Mm-hmm. So I wake up early. I got to rush. I got to scramble. I've got a lot of lessons to get through. I got to prepare them. I got to make copies. I got to answer emails. Got a lot of stuff to do. Mm -hmm. I teach my classes. And then I got to go to meetings after school. I got to make more copies. I got to prep more. I come home, lucky enough to, to eat some dinner. But then I have to go to the store, get some materials for my lesson the next day. Oh my gosh. Yes, go to Costco, buy... 400 apples or, you know, whatever I'm doing because I do do crazy things like that. Um, And then I come home and I got to grade papers. Hmm. Now it's six o'clock at night, seven o'clock at night. Got to grade papers. I'm up late at night doing that. Lucky if I get a few hours to myself. Yeah. And then I wake up and I do it all over again. Wow. You get 12 hour day. Yeah. Yeah. And do you ever have to put in time on the weekends to this too? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What about summers? Summers, I take all to myself. Yeah. <laughs> I need it to recharge because I do have those those long days and I like to to do something fun. Yeah. And just recharge because I need it for the next year. Right. So I, give, I give it my all, my right. whole heart. Yeah, you deserve it. <laughs> Thank <My gosh>. you. <laughs> are, are I need you, it. <laughs> are you ever having to do trainings in the summer or anything like oh, that? Oh, yeah. I okay. forgot about that. Yeah, okay. we do do what does trainings. That look like? Um, it depends. I mostly have AP trainings. Okay. So at the College Board, they'll have trainings in the summer. I did one a few months back on a Saturday from eight to three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot more that goes into it. A right. lot more. Right. So yeah. being a professional who is trusted at least by your school as uh, the, for being a professional. Yes. You're putting in a lot of extra work outside of just yes. your school days. Right. So maybe these people who think that schooling, uh, being a teacher is easy and having all this time off is great. You're off at three o'clock. Yeah. That's a big deal. Maybe they just don't understand uh, really what goes into this. Well, I mean, you could be off at three o'clock. If you okay. wanted to, mm-hmm. I could make a bare minimum lesson, just some boring notes and some boring homework, <laughs> Right. but I, I don't want to teach like that. And I want to be engaging and interesting and have cool stuff for them to do. And I want to make them do something crazy, like call the M&M company or something um, that's really going to throw them for a loop, you know, and get them interested. So there definitely are teachers that are off at three and they don't grade at home. Yeah, right. <laughs> and they don't offer tutoring after school for their students and they don't go to Costco and buy 400 apples, <laughs> you know, and they're not there on Saturdays. So there is that possibility. Right. 
Yeah. So yeah, it sounds like, again, you're holding yourself to a higher standard maybe than anyone would ever expect of you. Yeah. Because you've taken ownership over this role, regardless of who's watching or how much government oversight you have. Yeah. Yeah. That would be it. So mm-hmm. maybe, maybe the government, instead of trying to tell us how to teach, mm-hmm. should just be supporting teachers to be able to do what they want anyway, because they're going to do it with or without the government's help. That would be ideal, I think. Yeah. Could be. You're right. I, I wish. I wish. Mm-hmm. It, I wish. Yeah, I, know. I, hope, I hope someone with lots of money is listening that can make all Me this happen. Me too. For us. Yeah. <laughs> Please. You definitely deserve it. <laughs> Thank you. Now we're just about out of time. Do you okay. have any closing thoughts you want to leave the audience with? A quick goodbye or words of encouragement for students or parents or teachers out there? Um, well, I would like to encourage communities to have faith in teenagers. They're your future. You should believe in them and they're worth it. If you give them the opportunity, you'll see they're worth it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. Okay. So (laughs) now we have one, uh, a quick video here. Well, you're going to hear the audio of it, but it's mostly audio anyway. So this is the bald piano guy and he's doing a little satire on, on the... Uh, the inner workings of what it com- takes to be a teacher and comparing that to what it takes to be an education secretary, which I think is Ooh. especially poignant <laughs> at this day and age. So I just want to thank you one sure. more time for thank coming you for having in. Me, thank you for chatting thank you. with me. Thank you. It's been such a joy to have you here and I hope we can <laughs> have you, you back again sometime. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So we're going to listen to the bald piano guy. You can look him up on YouTube. He has some fun stuff and is I think you will enjoy it. Welcome to the English Language Assessment, the listening selection. On this listening part, I will read a brief selection. Then you'll have some time for some personal reflection. It's called Public School Teacher versus U.S. Education Secretary Requirements. You'll be asked to answer a question or two. Now listen as I read the selection to you. What is required to become an American public school teacher? As an example, here are the requirements for New York. You get a high school diploma, then you choose a school. And course after course you learn every rule you need. Hours of classes in the liberal arts And hours learning how to do those teaching parts And just when you thought you could hit the snooze You need hours in the target subject that you choose It's what they require for you to acquire A genuine teaching degree That seems a lot, but wait, there's more What about all those tests that teachers have to take? There's the EAS and the ALST and TP and the CST, then you teach as a student for experience, then you train yourself about abuse and violence, get your bachelor's degree and your master's too, and professional development until you're through, it's what they require for you to acquire, a genuine bona fide, permanent bona fide, certified teaching degree. That is a lot of stuff. I bet you can't imagine the requirements for the U.S. Education Secretary. Well, here they are. First your heart has to beat, then you gotta keep breathing. Question one. According to the passage that I read, what can you infer from the words I said? A. Perhaps public school teachers know a bit more about education than the education secretary. B. Perhaps public school teachers are a bit more qualified to discuss, contribute to, shape and reshape a child's development than the education secretary. C. Perhaps public school teachers are educated enough to be part of the process, more so than an education secretary who got the job simply by paying millions of dollars to the senators who confirmed her by one vote, or D, all of the above. It's what they require for you to acquire a genuine
the test is over, I will now collect your books.